Hello, uh, I'm Daniel Hast. I'm a postdoc at Boston University, uh, and I'm going to speak to you today about a study of error floor behavior in QCMD PC codes. Uh, this is a joint work with Sarah Arpin, who will be giving the second half of this talk, Tyler Billingsley, Junbo Lau, Ray Perlner, and Angela Robinson. Uh, this began as a collaboration at the uh, Rethinking Number Theory Conference uh, in summer of 2021. So uh, just as an outline, uh, so I'm going to start with some background on the bike crypto system and QCMD PC codes uh, and the error floor phenomenon that is key to the questions we want to study about this. Um, and then I'll get into our approach. Uh, and then Sarah will continue with uh, getting more in detail on our analysis of decoding failure rates and conclusions and next steps. Uh, so to begin, uh, the crypto system that we're studying is called Bike Bit Flipping Key Encapsulation, and it is a uh, code-based key encapsulation mechanism based on quasi-cyclic moderate-density parity check codes. Uh, the relevance of this to post-quantum cryptography is that it's one of the four remaining key encapsulation mechanisms in the fourth round of NIST's uh, post-quam crypto standardization process. Um, and three of these remaining ones are code-based. Uh, the only one that's actually been accepted so far at the end of the third round, in contrast, is lattice-based. Um, now, the sort of uh, main sort of sticking point here is in CCA security. Uh, and the issue is that there's a known key recovery attack on bike that exploits decoding failures uh, in an NCCA security model. And in order to mitigate this attack, uh, the decoding failure rate has to be uh, exponentially low relative to the claimed security bit level. Um, and so decoding failures essentially have to be so extraordinarily rare uh, at cryptographically relevant scales that um, you know one can't actually find decoding failures to carry out this attack in practice. So uh, just for background to explain uh, how bike works. Uh, so a binary linear code, this is a, a linear subspace of an n-dimensional vector space over the field with two elements uh, of some dimension k. And a vector in this linear subspace is called a code word. Uh, now, uh, binary linear codes, generally, we're going to represent those by a parity check matrix, which is a matrix that uh, gives zero exactly for the code words and not for other uh, vectors in the message space, um, which is to say that the rows of the parity check matrix give linear relations satisfied by the code words. And uh, for any uh, message vector, um, which we'll also call an error vector, um, uh, H times that vector is called the syndrome. So the syndrome is zero exactly for code words and non-zero for non-code words. Now, uh, what is an MDPC code? Well, a moderate density parity check code is a binary linear code that has a parity check matrix where each row has weight uh, approximately on the order of the square root of n, so the, the square root of the um, uh, length of uh, the, the dimension of the message space. Um, and here the weight is just the number of non-zero entries of the matrix. Uh, and a circulant matrix is a matrix in which each row is obtained by shifting the previous row one element to the right. So a QCMDPC code, where QC stands for quasi-cyclic, this is an MDPC code that has a parity check matrix that's composed of circulant blocks. Um, so it might not, the whole matrix uh, might not be, uh, and typically won't be a circulant matrix, but uh, you can break it up into blocks where each block is a circulant matrix. And these are the types of codes that are used in bike. Uh, so bike is uh, in particular, it's composed of two circulant blocks um, and uh, which we'll call H0 and H1 uh, and moderately dense parity check matrices. Uh, 
Uh, so getting into more detail, if R is the circulant block length, so that'd be one half N. Um, and T is the weight of the error vectors that we're going to be using as inputs. Well, the secret key uh, will be this QCMDPC parity check matrix, right? Um, and then the public key is essentially like a scrambled version of this, so that if you know the secret key, you can easily recover the public key. Uh, but going the other way is a hard problem. Um, and then the message is encoded as an error vector of this given weight. And the ciphertext is the syndrome. And uh, for the bike specification, the particular decoder used is called black gray flip. And this is a decoding algorithm that uh, takes the ciphertext as input and um, should return the error vector that was used to produce it. And so a decoding failure is when that doesn't happen. Um, and so the parameters for bike, uh, we have the block length R, and there's a few extra conditions that are needed on that to avoid certain known attacks. It has to be prime, and X to the R minus one has to only have the two obvious irreducible factors over the field with two elements. Um, and then we have the row weight uh, of the parity check matrix, the secret key, which uh, should be on the order of square root of N. Uh, we have the maximum error weight, and then the security parameter is computed in terms of uh, these other parameters. And so at cryptographically relevant scales, this would be, you know, starting at uh, 128 uh, for Lambda and, you know, going up from there for higher levels of security. So there's this phenomenon uh, for uh, low to moderate density parity check codes. Um, where the graph of the decoding failure rate uh, as you vary the block length uh, displays what's called an error floor phenomenon. And you can sort of see this uh, heuristically sketched in this graphic here, where um, when you graph block length versus the logarithm of the decoding failure rate, there's first a region of rapid decrease in the DFR called the waterfall region. And then it uh, sort of abruptly shifts to uh, decrease that's better approximated uh, linearly and with a you know, significantly smaller slope. And this is called the error floor region. And so in order to accurately predict uh, how the DFR behaves as we increase the block length, we have to account for this error floor phenomenon. Um, otherwise, we could... Uh, radically underestimate the DFR, um, which of course could, you know, compromise a security analysis um, if we don't know the DFR is really as low as it should be. So for LDPC codes, uh, one of the standard approaches for analyzing decoding failure rates is to represent the code uh, using what's called a Tanner graph. This is a sparse bipartite graph uh, whose graph theoretic properties are connected in various ways to um, the properties of the decoder um, for these iterative decoders. Um, and in particular, uh, the prevalence of small closed loops is connected to the probability of decoding failure. So this is a really useful tool um, for analyzing decoding failure rates of LDPC codes. Um, and in particular, an uh, important uh, concept here is that of a near code word. So this allows us to sort of relax the notion of code word and instead look at uh, error vectors of a given weight whose syndrome has low weight. Um, and we allow the, the both of these weights as parameters in the definition. Uh, and so uh, McKay and Postel uh, showed that near code words with small u and v as well as low weight code words uh, these cause a high error floor for certain LDPC codes. This is a sort of known, well-studied phenomenon in the LDPC case. Uh, now for MDPC codes, there's a problem, which is that the Tanner graph is less sparse. And so it tends to not be feasible to uh, directly extend these LDPC code uh, techniques. Um, it's just not really feasible to analyze a less sparse Tanner graph in the same way. Um, 
and sort of the issue with these iterative decoders um, that are used for bike is that, you know, there's not just some like neat closed forms or probabilistic analysis we can do. Um, and so um, there have been a few approaches toward trying to better understand error floors of MDPC codes. Um, so Baldi et al. Uh, actually rigorously proved the existence of an error floor for QC MDPC codes. And so we do know there is an error floor phenomenon. The question is, where does it occur? You know, how to actually quantify it? Um, and uh, Vasur um, defined three particular known sets of near code words and low weight code words and analyzed their impact on the uh, bike decoding failure rate. And this then uh, gives us sort of um, uh, some lower bounds on the DFR, uh, you know, coming from the contribution to the uh, decoding failure rate coming from these known classes. Um, the question is, of course, how do we get upper bounds on the DFR? Um, so let's talk about our approach now. Uh, so our approach is to uh, analyze uh, decoding failure rates uh, in detail at the 20-bit level um, and carry out these experiments. Um, so you know the cryptographically relevant scale is like starting at 128-bit. Um, so this is much smaller scale, which allows us to carry out certain analyses that are infeasible at the sort of full cryptographically relevant scale. Um, so we use bike design parameters to generate our parameter sets uh, for a security level of lambda equals 20. And we use uh, Boston University's shared computing cluster. It's a, a heterogeneous uh, Linux-based computing cluster uh, to run uh, highly parallelizable experiments. And then we analyze these decoding failures in detail to see well, what factors are contributing to these decoding failures and what implications does that have for the error floor and so on. So the parameters that we started with are uh, R equals 523, uh, W, so the uh, row weight of the parity check matrix is 30, uh, the error weight is 18, and uh, security parameter 20. And then we allow R to vary, uh, so extending the block sizes um, while leaving the other parameters fixed in order to find the error flaw. So there's also a issue of weak keys that we have to consider. Uh, Vasur identifies three classes of weak keys for the byte crypto system based on, and this depends on a weak key threshold that we call capital T. Um, for LOM equals 20, we determine experimentally that we have to set uh, t equals three. Um, if you set higher, you actually see a radical increase in decoding failure rates um, that's sort of being dominated by a weak key phenomenon. Um, and so uh, the, our process then for uh, analyzing DFRs is, um, well, we sample a random key and reject and repeat uh, if we happen to get a weak key. Uh, we sample a random message, so uh, you know, random error vector as input e, compute its syndrome, run the black gray flip, uh, flip decoder, um, and then well, we look at the output and see is this the same as the original input that produced the syndrome? And if they're not equal, then we found a decoding failure and we record that, and then we repeat this process uh, you know some number of times. So here you can see the results uh, just for, uh, you know, sort of raw decoding failure rates um, without getting into like the analysis of, you know, what classes of code word or near code word are driving these decoding failures, just the raw DFR plot here. Um, and this is, uh, the data points here are accompanied by 95% confidence intervals. Um, also, uh, the reason that these dots are a little unevenly spaced out, these are all of the values of R uh, in this range we analyzed uh, that meet these criteria of R being prime and also uh, X to the R minus one has only two irreducible factors. Uh, so for the values of R starting at 587 onward, uh, we tested 10 to the eighth keys for each. Um, we tested fewer keys uh, for the smaller values simply because uh, 
well, when decoding failure rates are higher, uh, there's no need to conduct as many trials to get you know, a high degree of confidence, uh, so to narrow those confidence intervals. Um, and so you can uh, consult the paper for the exact number of trials. It uh, starts at uh, 10 to the third for the you know, very small values around 400 and then steps up in uh, powers of 10, um, uh, sort of in order to get confidence intervals that are, um, you know, as you see. Um, and then uh, the fit lines here. Uh, so a quadratic fit seems to be an almost perfect fit in the waterfall region that's in blue. And then you can see when it switches to this sort of more linear fit here uh, in red, that's the error floor region. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to Sarah for the second part of the talk. Yes, so now let's proceed to talk a little bit more about the DFR that we found. Um, there are special sets that we know will cause decoding failures, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these. These were originally identified by um, Vassar's thesis, where he defined these three sets of code words and also defined a notion of distance from these sets. So first, code words themselves all have the same syndrome. So this is obviously going to cause an issue with our iterative decoder that only uses the syndrome to tell vectors apart. Uh, that's our set C here. Then next, the set N of DD near code words are weight D vectors coming from one of the rows of the circulant one of the rows of one of the circulant blocks of the parity check matrix. Um, these will have syndrome weight D as well, and that's going to cause uh, some decoding failures. There'll be multiple that you can't distinguish. Uh, the set 2N comes from summing together two elements from the set N. So you can mix and match rows of the parity check matrix. And these also result in difficult to distinguish vectors. Uh, so you'll notice that these sets of vectors C, N, and 2N are constructed in a very specific way, and they all have specific weights themselves. Since our error vectors that we've plugged into our decoder all have weight, well, for us, 18, but it's a fixed weight for all of our error vectors, they may not be able to be in any of these sets. Um, so Vassar introduced a notion of distance from these sets C, N, and 2N. There's sort of two ways to look at it. L is usually used to denote our overlaps with the vectors of C, N, and 2N. So if you have an error vector E, you can look at the maximum sure product. Um, sorry, the maximum size of the weight of the sure product for a vector in your uh, set C, N, and 2N, and this will define a notion of overlap with that set. Another way of looking at it is a distance from S, how many bits you would need to flip to get to a vector in S. So large L means large overlap, and you'll be close to S. Small delta means small distance, and you'll be near S. Vectors in or near C, N, and 2N will have difficult to distinguish syndromes and potentially cause decoding failures. For an example, to recall the H from our previous slides, uh, we can take the null space of H and look at those vectors. You'll notice that the vector provided here will have syndrome weight zero. Uh, N, you can take any half row of this parity check matrix, so you'll be able to find an additional vector in N that would have the same syndrome as the one provided for you here. From 2N, as mentioned before, these are sums of vectors in N. Our contribution is to experimentally look at these sets at the 20-bit security level and figure out which ones are causing the actual decoding failures that we saw at this security level. 
So for our parameters, the R values that we looked at in this portion of the analysis were 523, 587, and 659. So right at the end of the waterfall region where the air floor is starting, we were using vectors of weight 18 to feed into the decoder. And our uh, sets C, N, and 2N are defined as follows here. So the vectors in C would be weight 30, in N would be weight 15, and in 2N would be weight at most 30, and those sums certain things can cancel out, so you might have a little bit of um, difference in that particular set. So with our error vectors of weight 18, we're really looking at how many overlaps they might have with one of these sets CN or 2N, or for delta, how far they are from CN and 2N. So here we have a decoding failure rate graph looking at error vectors of weight 18 that are different distances from CN and 2N. You'll notice up here we have delta R distance. The closer our vectors are to the sets CN and 2N, the worse their decoding failure performance, right? Up here we have terrible decoding failures. And over here to the right, we have basically the security parameter that we would expect. So I have graphed here the generic DFR for this particular R value, just so you can compare and see what's happening. So it's clear from this graph that when we are close to one of these sets, CN and 2N, our decoding process is going to fail more often than from the generic uh, average DFR. So after looking at this, we wanted to see, okay, how many overlaps do we have between vectors that are causing decoding failures and randomly generated vectors? Um, how many overlaps do we have with these sets C, N, and 2N for, say, R equals 587, as we looked at before? On the left, we have a bar graph here showing the max L value for the max number of overlaps with one of these sets 2N, C, or N. And you can see that these number of overlaps range from 2 to 10. Uh, for randomly generated vectors of the same weight, it's actually around the same range, only from two to seven here for the randomly generated vectors. So a few less overlaps with that set 2n, but still not a huge difference. This was interesting to us. We still think that the syndrome weight is guiding these decoding failures. So in our experiments, we had saved all of the vectors that are causing these decoding failures, and we can look at their syndrome weights. We plotted these for all of the R values that we were looking at. So you'll note the range that we have been kind of picturing is in, in here at the moment. And we can compare the syndrome weights of these vectors causing decoding failures to the average syndrome weights. So average syndrome weights you'll see in these red dotted plots. These are average syndrome weights for vectors um, in these different R values, but they're all vectors of weight 18. And then the ones that are causing decoding failures, especially as R increases, are of significantly lower syndrome weight than the generic vectors. So this is in our error floor region for sure. So considering that the syndrome weight seems to still be causing the decoding failures, but the overlaps with CN and 2N are not as extreme as we would have expected, we wanted to compare all of this in one graph, basically. We have our average DFR plotted, um, sorry, our average syndrome weight plotted with this green dotted line the syndrome weight for vectors causing decoding failures plotted with this dotted line here, and then the syndrome weights based on the number of overlaps with CN and 2N plotted with these blue, black, 
and red dots here. So for our decoding failure vectors, the average numbers of overlaps with a vector in CN and 2N is actually not very high, right? A mean number of overlaps of about three, three and a half, or maybe even five for that larger set 2N is not an extreme number of overlaps. And yet we still are seeing this difference in the syndrome weight causing the decoding failures. So conclusions from this data and sort of next steps to look at. We can conclude that we still have this water flow and air floor picture for the 20 bit security level. Uh, we have experimentally shown it with our first uh, experiment. The sets C, N, 2N and the corresponding vectors, which are close to these sets, are not overly represented among our decoding failures. But decoding failure vectors do seem to have lower than average syndrome weight. In our next steps, we hope to explore the error floor at higher security levels and use rigorous mathematics to prove that our 20 bit data can tell us something about cryptographic size. Uh, we are looking to classify the error vectors which do heavily contribute to decoding failures, um, finding new categories of these near code words that cause DFRs. And we're trying to see if it's possible during the iterative decoding process that the input error vector, which maybe doesn't seem like it's very close to CN or 2N, actually gets closer to one of these sets and we see errors in this iterative process because of that. That something we're looking into uh, the specific decoder in bike uh, for. Uh, we're also looking at LDPC code techniques from Tanner Graphs. Is there a way that we can extend these techniques or use Tanner Graphs to identify these near code words, even if the graphs are not as feasible for MDPC codes as they are for LDPC codes? So we're sort of looking at trying to extend those techniques to the MDPC setting as well. And thank you. We have our uh, link to our ePrint article for you here, and these slides should be available as well. Thank you.